Uh, thank you, Adina, and thank you, Baruch, for joining us tonight. Um, for those of you who are perhaps not uh, so familiar with um, my rabbi and teacher, uh, Rabbi Professor David Halivni, Zichon uh, I'm going to give a short, very short review of his biography. If you'll bear with me for a few minutes. Uh, Rav David Halivni, or born as Rav David, as David Weiss, I was born in a small town in Czechoslovakia, now in the Ukraine, in 1927. And as a very small child, moved to Siget in uh, Transylvania in Romania to live with his maternal grandfather, Rabbi Yeshayahu Weiss, who was a great scholar of a, and a Belzer Hasid and became effectively his first teacher. In Siget, he is, is well known, was good friends with, uh, with the uh, later author, Elie Wiesel. And he was ordained at the age of 15, Yora Yora Yadin Yadin on the entire Shulchan Aruch. Unfortunately, in 1944, he was deported with his entire family to Auschwitz and subsequently to several labor camps. And he was the only member of his immediate family to survive the Holocaust. He arrived in the United States in 1947 and immediately had a chance a meeting with Professor Shaul Lieberman of the Jewish Theological Seminary, who was later to become his most important mentor. He studied for seven years with Rav Yitzhak Hutner in Yeshiva Chaim Berlin in Brooklyn and received a second smicha from the uh, posek of Binyamin Tamashov in New York. While he was uh, learning in Yeshiva, he began university, in high school and then university. He received a BA in philosophy from Brooklyn College in 1953. He also there met his future wife, Tsipora Hager, who was the granddaughter of the Vishnitzer Rebbe. In 1956, he received an MA degree from New York University with a thesis on the Protestant theologian Paul Tillich. Uh, and he came around this time to JTS to study with Professor Lieberman and to concentrate initially on the Talmud Yerushalmi. He received his doctorate in Talmud in 1958 for fragments of a commentary on Ta'anit, which later became his first book and became almost immediately began teaching Talmud at JTS and becoming a full professor in 1969. He also taught in the religion department as an adjunct professor at Columbia University from the 60s and from 1986 was a Lydiar professor of classical Jewish civilization. In 1983, uh, Rav Halivni left the seminary over the issue of the ordination of women and founded the Union for Traditional Judaism, the UTJ, where he served as the head and also the head of their, of their uh, rabbinic program at the Matifta. From 1992, he served as a rabbi of Kilat Orach Eliezer in Manhattan until making Aliyah in 2005. After his Aliyah, Professor Livni taught at Hebrew University and at Bar Ilan University. Over the years, he received the Bialik Prize in 1985 the National Jewish Book Award in 1997, and in 2008, the Israel Prize for Talmudic Research. His books include his magnum opus, Makor de Masorot, a 10-volume commentary on most of the Babylonian Talmud, his autobiography, and four other English books of Talmudic, Biblical, and Holocaust scholarship that we'll discuss as we go on. And as is noted, he has three sons, Boruch, who's with us tonight, uh, Ephraim and Shai. Uh, Boruch, I'm going to, uh, I just mentioned your father's all yes, I'm going to start, start at the end, uh, because it's also a place for us to begin. Please tell us a little bit about your father's relationship with the National Library before and especially after he made Aliyah in 2005. Of course, it was a, it was a wonderfully close relationship. Um, when he would come here, when he would come, excuse me, to Israel, when he would come from the United States to Israel, he would regularly park himself at the library, the, the, um, the Ulama Yahadut, the, the Judaica Hall, where he would do his research, he would meet with people. Um, and then once he made Aliyah, that was where he studied every day. Um, when he was writing a book, he would type up the, his research in the morning, and then he'd go midday to the library where he had a regular place where he sat all the time. He loved going to the library for many reasons. The resources, of course, were stupendous and would have what he was looking for. Um, and he needed quite a bit of resources for his work. Also, he just loved interacting with the people who were there. And when people 
began to realize that he was going there on a daily basis. I think it attracted a lot of people to come to the library to sit and study there and to talk. Um, the librarians would shush people when they were talking, but they never shushed Abba. He somehow had had free license. And when he, it was a short conversation, he would have it in the library. And if it was a long conversation, he'd, he'd take people out, out of the, the reading room to a place where they could talk, or he would often have them um, accompany him to lunch where it, it, nothing, it, nothing made him happier than having the chicken sh soup and schnitzel at the, uh, at the cafeteria at the, at the library. That was, uh, that was his big meal and his big treat of the day. And he was always dragging somebody along or somebody was following him to spend some time with him over lunch. So um, I also, when I did my master, spent a lot of time in the library. So we are grateful to the library for sponsoring this, grateful to the library for giving it and uh, giving uh, my father an opportunity to continue his studies there. I'll just sort of say last one thing is last few years when he began to lose some, some cognitive ability, he stopped going to the library. Um, um, but he still had his Makom Kavu, his regular seat, and everybody knew it was Professor Olivni's place. And when he passed away, somebody sent me a photo of a bouquet of flowers that somebody anonymously had placed on, on his study seat, on the, the, the seat that the librarians would always um, um, would always uh, reserve for him. And even without any sign or any note, everybody knew what, what the flowers were there and, and why they were at that particular spot. So... Thank you again to the to the library for being his home away from home. Wonderful, and I I also when I when I started to work in the library, for me the biggest uh, the biggest perk of all was that I got to see him and talk with him every day without having to make a special trip there. And I would I would add he loved his seat he chose because it was right opposite the open bookshelves there that had his books, and he just as he would study he'd always he'd always peer up to see who was. Who was um, looking at his books? Which book they were looking at? And most importantly, how long were they spending with with his books? That was very important. Okay, so I think uh, since you've mentioned his books, let us uh, start to delve in a little bit to his own uh, methodology. Tell us. So we'll go into it even more deeply, hopefully a little bit later on. But for now, please give us a basic introduction. What was the unique shita, the unique Talmudic methodology that your father? Uh, brought to the world? So um, uh, that's a, a, a hard question to answer in the abstract, but I will try. The example that we'll give later, I think, will will shed light for folks because we'll, we'll go through just one particular example of how he applied his methodology to the Talmud. Um, but overall, what he did, in, in, and it's reflected in the name of his, his magnum opus, Mikorotu Misorot, Sources and Traditions. Um, since uh, since his days as a child, he struggled with the fact that so many explanations in the in the Talmud, the explanations offered by the Gemara, seemed strained, strained, excuse me, strained. Um, and the 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 the, the Chazal and the rabbis of the Gemara were just impeccably logical, and yet applying their their logic, they would sometimes come to to dichukim, to strained responses. And as a child, he struggled with that, and he. He 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 didn't like the strained explanations of the subsequent commentators as they tried to explain the strained um, responses or answers that the Gemara would give. Um, and ultimately, what he realized as he as he developed as a scholar that many of the difficulties that he encountered um, could be resolved if you understood not just what the the subject matter was talking about, but how it was orally transmitted over the generations. That's with the sources and traditions. How, how did it become a tradition? And how do oral traditions change over time? With the result that many times when traditional commentators would try to resolve two passages with a logical um, reconciliation, he would point out that actually, if you understand how this material was transmitted, if you understand perhaps different texts that that people had unbeknownst to one another, um, you begin to understand that many of the difficulties derive from the fact that the Gemara had no choice but to reach a strained conclusion because it was unaware perhaps of, of, of exactly how it was transmitted. Um, and when you take the multiple, the many, many sources that we have today and you examine them carefully, 
you have actually many resources that scholars of generations past don't have as to what was transmitted and how it was transmitted. And that gives you tools to reconcile passages in ways that had not been before. And this applies to every page of the Gemara. Um, ultimately, where he ended up in, 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 in following and cataloging the transmission and the historical development of the Gemara, he ultimately later, later in his development came to the conclusion that about 70%, 60 or 70% of the Gemara, which he called the Stam, means nameless. It's when you, you study a passage and you say the Gemara asks, because there's just a question not attributed to anybody. About 30% or so is attributed to individual rabbis, but about 70% is not. He realized that about 70% of the Gemara is actually hundreds of years later than it had been thought. And that becomes very important historically for historians of the Talmud, but also for understanding the passages, because it means that 70% of the Talmud is explaining um, um, rabbis who may have lived hundreds of years before and were not contemporaneous explanations as has had been thought by some. Okay, this is of course fascinating and, and what may or may not be apparent to some of our listeners is that it's actually very radical in certain ways compared to the traditional way of studying the Gemara. And later when we give an example, we'll, uh, we'll go into that more. Um, but in light of what you just said, I want to read a passage that you yourself wrote uh, in the introduction to the Sefer Yovel, the Jubilee volume, Nitivot Ludavi, that was presented to your father many years ago. And you wrote the following thing. He traveled a great intellectual distance to arrive at the same point of departure. Do you want to elaborate on that a bit? Sure. Um, as a child, as, as you pointed out, he had smicha by the age of 15. He was a pro child prodigy in Ilui, and he spent countless hours studying Talmud. He, he, he remembers the particular point in his childhood. I remember as I'm speaking of him in the present tense, but he used to tell me of the particular point in childhood where he stopped playing, um, that uh, he got comments that he was such a prodigy. Why would he want to waste any time playing as a child? He should be studying Talmud as a child. And he stopped, he stopped playing. He enjoyed the Talmud anyway. He was very happy doing that. So it wasn't that much of a sacrifice. And, um, but as a child, as, as I mentioned before, he was very disturbed by the strained answers. And he would go to his grandfather, who was his teacher. And, and his grandfather also would always take the simple explanation, re reject the pilpulim, the, the convoluted explanations that many commentators had given. So he had good training in what we call the pshat, the simple explanation from his grandfather. And, he, and he'd, go, he'd go to his grandfather and he'd say, Zayde, Zayde, what, why? Why is this? And, and he would sometimes cry. And, and his mom would turn to the grandfather and say, help him. Look at the poor boy. He's in pain. And grandfather would say, I can't help him. He's right. It's painful. I don't, I don't quite know. I, I, I don't have any explanation to give. So as a boy, he was already spending endless hours studying the text and endless hours trying to understand and come up with the explanations. And of course, as a child, he wasn't coming up with explanations that had to do with sources and traditions and transmissions and historical development. As he got older and he became a professor, he comes back to the same passages that he studied as a child. And just as he studied the passage as a child, he would study it again. He was bothered by the dichukim, the strained passages, just as he was a child. The difference was um, now we had a new tool. Now we had a new way of explaining them that really unlocked so many of the doors that had been shut to him as a child. And so that's what I tried to convey when I wrote that passage for his Sefer Ayovel, that He's traveled this great intellectual distance. Of course, he went to college, he studied philosophy, but that isn't, wasn't the primary thing I was talking about. His, his intellectual development about the Talmud had developed immensely, but enabled him to go back to the very same questions and issues that it, it, it troubled him as a little boy. Beautiful. Um, I'll add to that, that he, he once uh, talked talk to me about the fact that most of the Talmudic scholars... Uh, since the beginning of the Wissenschaftes uh, Judentums, the you know academic study of uh, of Talmud, almost all abandoned the Babylonian Talmud, which was at the center of yeshiva learning, and dedicated themselves to Tanic, Tanitic literature or the Yerushalmi or things like that. And he initially wanted to go in that direction, went to study Yerushalmi, and he ended up, as he said, going back to the Bavli and making uh, going back home where he started and putting his life into that. And all of and, and many of those scholars left the Bavli because they, they were bothered by the, the strained answers, the Dichukim that we're talking about. And actually, 
they they miss the most interesting part of the Talmud by doing so, as as Abba demonstrated in his ten volumes on the uh, on Mekor, of Mekorot to Masora. Okay, if we're if you mention the most interesting parts of the Talmud, that which is obviously somewhat subjective, leads me to my next question, which is why did your father not apply his methodology very much to the Agadah, to the non legal sections of the Babylonian Talmud? It's, it seems that he pretty much skips them. He doesn't devote nearly as much attention, that is right. And I think it's because um, there isn't the same back and forth discussion with respect to the Agata. The Agata, the stories, they kind of recite the stories. Yes, sometimes they're the basis for discussion. I'm not going to say never, but um, they are, but but not with the same reach as the halachic discussions. You don't have, therefore, you don't have as many of these explanations and dihukim, you don't have as much stam which is the later material that's trying to explain the earlier material. So the things that interested him about the Talmud stemmed more from the halachic portions um, where you had much more back and forth discussions, effort, efforts to reconcile what seems to be irreconcilable um, and, and, um, and more historical development. Whereas the Agada, you have more of a recitation of the stories. Again, that's an overgeneralization to be sure, but I think that that, that is why. Okay, thank you. Um, zooming out for a moment, uh, after uh, in, in the eighties, after working for some twenty, almost twenty years on Macorda Masorot and publishing the first two volumes, your father took a break, not completely, but to a large extent, and began writing books in English for a wider audience, presumably, um, which included his own autobiography, um, but also included uh, another. A volume about the Mishnah and Tanitic literature in comparison to the Gemara in English, and then two books that had to do with essentially biblical theology and culminating with uh, a book on Holocaust theology, which obviously was very relevant to his background. And yes. needless to say, this slowed down his work on Mikorot or Misorot, which he did continue to work on during that time, but at a much slower pace, and then he went back to it. Why do you think at that time in his career, at that stage in his life, he felt the need to expand his horizons, expand his message, reach a wider audience. What was going on with that? Well, I, I, um, I think there are a few answers to that. Um, one is, of course, these other ideas, whether it was Holocaust theology, um, um, a pro -bib theology of the Bible, um, the, the, the other issues that interested him had always interested him. Remember, he had studied philosophy in college. He wasn't only a Talmudist. He had a broad range of, of interests. And there had always been um, something in him bugging him to, to write about these other issues as well. Um, but there was something that precipitated it. And the primary, the primary trigger, I think, for that was his transition, his move, um, his very painful move from the seminary, the Jewish Theological Seminary to Columbia. And he was moving from a world where all his colleagues and everybody in his very small universe could um, uh, read and understand Hebrew, um, and especially the kind of semi-rabbinic Hebrew that he would use, utilize in commenting on the Gemara and Mekorot and Sarod. And now he's moving to Colombia. And the, one colleague down the hall might be a professor of Buddhism, and the next professor might be a professor of the history of the Catholic Church, and, and so on. And these people were not reading Mekorot and Sarod. They were not going to be able to appreciate um, the books that he wrote in Hebrew about the 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 transmission of the Torah Shabbat Pad, the oral law. So that was another impetus. Um, um, in 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 some sense, I should point out that when he left Columbia, it was a very difficult. I'm sorry, when he left the seminary to go to Columbia, it was a very difficult time for him. Um, the the issue of whether or not to admit women to the rabbinical school was very hard for him. He understood that there were many. Of these women who were very sincere, and he was exploring ways to make it happen. And ultimately, the seminary went off in a direction that he could never agree with. When they they ultimately decided to make the decision as a um, um, admissions decision rather than a halachic decision, and that's where he he that was the final straw for him um, because he could be very liberal on halachic issues, but it had to be decided on a halachic basis, and. Um, he was afraid at one point um, that he would find no other place. Um, where would he go? He couldn't go back to the world of orthodoxy because he'd written such radical thoughts. Um, and he was no longer feeling at home at, at the seminary. But his 
whole whole his 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 works had all been written in Hebrew and not even modern Hebrew. And um, what was he going to do? So so he felt this impetus when he was accepted at Columbia to demonstrate at Columbia that that he could be a scholar on a more general level and could be appreciated by an English speaking audience. So it was a combination of the fact that these issues had always interested him. And um, I think with the fact that he had shifted to Columbia, that he felt he wanted to reach a wider audience and show his colleagues that he could reach a wider audience. And he did, he did. There was a cost. Um, ultimately, he did almost the entire Talmud in Mekorot to Masorot, but because of the break that he took, and I remember talking about it, I go, Abba, you have to go back to Mekorot to Masorot. He goes, well, but I have another idea. And Abba, you really have to go back to do it. And we published uh, posthumously the last volume that covered Mesechet Zvachim Menachot in the first 40 Dapim of Chulin. So he almost finished, but he didn't quite finish. And of course, had he devoted that, those years exclusively to Mekorot to Masorot, he would have undoubtedly finished. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, now is the, we're going to dive in a little bit deeper. This is the part for uh, people to, to concentrate more. And we're going to uh, do an example of uh, Rafa Livni's Talmudic methodology. So I'm going to share the screen and let, or do you want to first introduce the topic before I put up? Sure, the first? Uh, let, me, let me take one second to introduce the topic and then we'll start. So um, it's hard to pick a simple example because for most to appreciate most of his examples, you have to spend. You have to have spent countless hours studying the particular passage. You have to have explored all the other commentaries that explain the passage for the since the time it, it, they edited 15, 1200 to fifteen hundred years ago, depending again on how you date things. He 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 was always pushing the date later and later and later. But there are countless commentaries, and because as he would say, sometimes what appeared difficult to him, if you found the right commentary with the right explanation, seemed to work. And you don't start offering radical um, source tradition type um, interpretations if a simple explanation works. Um, and so uh, it's not super easy finding examples that we can share, but I think we have one. This is an example he liked to use often when he was um, trying to illustrate his methodology. This has to do with the law of divorce, the law of get or gitin in plural. And um, um, it, it, we're going to start, um, it, it, it's his explanation of one of the Mishnayot, one, a, a Mishnah that deals with the topic of how a man gives a get to um, the wife in order to effectuate the divorce. And we'll start first with the relevant verse. Um, so let's put that up, um, see what the Torah says about it. The Torah does make a reference to the giving of a get. It calls it um, a Sefer Kritut. So you see, we, we have the verse, it's from Deuteronomy chapter 24. So um, why don't you scroll down a little bit so everybody could see the translation. This is the JPS translation. Um, and um, I'm not sure I agree in full with this very, very good translation of this verse, but it, it really doesn't matter. We're focusing on the last part of the verse, which talks about how is the husband supposed to give the get to the wife? And here it says, and he writes her a bill of divorcement, hands it to her, and sends her away from his house. The Hebrew that is translated here, hands it to her, is vinatan biyada. That's the critical phrase, vinatan biyada. He should give it unto her hand. Yad literally means hand. What's important is it doesn't say vinatan la. He gives it to her. Although the English translation says hands it to her, it's and and vinatan la. It doesn't say he shall give it to her. He shall give it biyada to her hand, literally. And beyada can mean literally her hand, means one possible interpretation is that the husband has to literally hand it to the wife, has to take it in her hands before there is a divorce, the, the get. Or beyada can mean more generally her inner possession. Vinatan beyada has to give it to her in her inner possession um, and not necessarily directly to her hand. But the fact that it says vinatan beyada, give it to her hand, and doesn't say vinatan la, gave it to her, despite the translation suggests that there has to be something more direct, more specific in the way he hands it over. For example, Natan La gives it to her. Maybe he could slip it under her door, right? The door of her apartment or the door of her house or through the mail slot, um, or just leave it on her premises or her property. Natan La, if had it said Natan La, it might suggest something like that as, as simple as that, 
would be okay, but it says something more, v'natan biyada, something more specific, and that's where the Mishnah wants to help us understand what that means and what limits there are to that. So now we go to the Mishnah that he explained. This is a Mishnah from the, fir the first Mishnah in the eighth chapter of Gitin. Hazorek get ishto. This is somebody, I mean, you know, sometimes tempers are, are there and, and doesn't even want to give it to her. Hazorek, the, ma the man throws the get um, at his wife. Vehi betoch beta, and she is in her home or in her chatzer, in her courtyard at the time. That is an that is a valid divorce. Harezi megoresh. That satisfies the the biblical phrase of vinatan biyada. Now notice what the Mishnah says. It says vehi betoch beta, and she is in the house. So, what the Mishnah is saying is, if you put it under the door when she's not there, if you slip it under the door, or you leave it in the courtyard when she is not there that would not be a valid divorce. Vehi betoch beta, and she is in the house or she is in the chatzer. So the way this Mishnah interprets the verse v'natan biada, it's not, it, it, it recognizes that it says v'natan biada and not v'natan la, just give it to her. Um, but it also doesn't interpret yad to be literal right in her hand. So the kind of the compromise that the Mishnah strikes by virtue of the use of the word in the Torah biyada is, no, it doesn't have to put it literally in her hand. You can put it on her premises, but she has to be there. That that's where you satisfy betoch yada. Um, um, that's where you satisfy the verse where it says vinat. Excuse me, vinatan bi yada. Um, okay, so the Mishnah says I want you to focus on the word vihi vihi betoch yada, and she is in the house or in the in the yard, and it, then it would be a valid um, get. All right, so now let's go to the Gemara, the Gemara's discussion of this. Okay, so this is the Gemara explaining this Mishnah, and it says, "Vehi betoch beita." Quote: It's quoting the first, the words of the Mishnah that it's now going to discuss. The words that we just saw when the husband um, gives her or throws the get to the house. It's a valid way of transmitting or transferring the get, um, as long as "Vehi betoch beita." She's now Amar Ula. So Ula is a later commentator after the time of the Mishnah. He's an Amora. Vehu sheomedet betzad beita. It says, she must be standing, he doesn't say in the chatzer, in the bayit, in the chatzer, but next to, bitzad. So we already have something odd, because the Mishnah says, she has to be in the house, vehi betoch beta. Ula said, well, she could also be standing next to the house, next to the yard. She doesn't have to be in it, she could be next to it. Well, where does that come from? But then even more difficult and problematic, Raboshia disagrees with him and says, no, the, the, the wife receiving the get doesn't even have to be next to the house or next to the chatzer. Rabbi Oshia Amar, Afil Hibit Tferia, the chatzer Rabbi Tzipori. Even if she's in one city, the city of Tferia, and her property, her premises are in the city of Tzipori, a different town, a different city, or Hibit Tzipori, or she's in the town of Tzipori, the chatzer Rabbi Tferia, and her premises are in Tferia, Megoresh. Now, where does that come from? I mean, these are Amoraim, they cannot disagree with a Mishnah. That, that was this common premise in the Gemara that a later rabbi, an Amora, a rabbi of the period of the Gemara, cannot disagree with um, a, a Tana or a Mishnah unless he has somebody else, some other Tana from the period of the Mishnah supporting his view. So how does Rabosha, when the Mishnah says, Vihi betoch beita, how does he say even if they're in different cities? How does that work? Um, so the Gemara itself points it out. Doesn't the Gemara asks? This is the nameless Gemara, by the way, which is the seventy percent, which is nameless. Um, this is what we call the Stam, which which Ab identified as being particularly late. The Mishnah says she's in the house, she's in the courtyard. What do you mean she could be in a different city? This is what he means. This is this is what the Mishnah means. The, the Gemara is now reinterpreting the Mishnah to say. She doesn't have to be in the house, but it has to be as if she's in the house. What does it mean to be not in the house, but as if you're in the house? So the Gemara says, um, It's as if she's in the house. It's as if she's in the courtyard. Because what we're talking about, if you could scroll down here and see, this is the Safaria um, uh, inter uh, translation. If the courtyard is secured with her knowledge, and, and, and this happens with her knowledge, it is as if she were there and she is therefore divorced. In other words, 
the Gemara, in trying to reconcile what seems to be irreconcilable, the mission that says she's in the house, and Raboshia says she could be in a different city, then how does Raboshia explain the language of the Mishnah? No, he must explain it, the Gemara says, that it's as if she were in the house, and we say it's as if she's in the house, if the house and the yard had a fence and was secured with her knowledge, well, um, it's as if she's there. It's almost as if they're saying it's like she has the ring app. And even if she is far away from her home, she can see what's going on in her home at all times. If she has that kind of relationship to her home, then it's as if she's in her home and the um, uh, the, the the husband, by by tossing the the get into that kind of home with her the data with her knowledge, um, it satisfies the requirement of the Mishnah that, he, that she be in her home. Now this passage always troubled Abba. It, it's what does it mean? Uh, a courtyard that is secured is like she's in. The, let's go back to the Mishnah. Let's go back to the the the, the Mishnah. Um, if we could scroll back, um, Tzvi, back to the Mishnah. And the Mishnah says, get If you throw a get to the, a man throws a get to the, a uh, husband throws a get to the wife, and she is in the house. In the house, that's what it says. It doesn't say it's as if she's in the house, but a thousand miles away, or the, the house is secured, that somehow makes it as if she was in the house. And this is what would bother This is an example of one of the dichukim, the kind of strained answers that the Gemara would give that would trouble. And he would say, why is the Gemara giving this difficult answer? Why, 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 why? Or to put it another way, why did Rav Oshia say that even different cities far apart would work, even if she's in Tsipori and, um, and the helm is in Tveria or vice versa? How, how, could he, how could he say that? So Abba looked at this Mishnah and Abba said, you know, I wonder about the word vihi. It's as almost as if Rav Oshia, who says they can be in different cities, doesn't have that word in his Mishnah. get Notice I've switched the bet to a lamet. That appears to be what Rav Oshia is saying. That, the, that He seems to be looking at a Mishnah that says if somebody casts a get to his wife, throws a get to his wife, um, into her home or into her chatzir without the word vihi and she, which says, and she is in the house. But rather, if he throws it into the house or throws it into the chatzir, she is divorced. And so he just had this sense that the word vihi, um, what, what's it doing there? And he started to look and look, and he began to find that many of the commentators, and Rashi is just one of many, includes Rashi, Meiri, the Rambam, who quote this Mishnah Quote it without the word vihi. Let me give you this passage from Bava Mitzia. Um, this is a Rashi. They're dealing with a case with a minor. The, some, some girls were betrothed when they were minors and trying to figure if, if a man betrothes a girl when she is a minor and then decides he doesn't want to go through with it and he wants to divorce her, can he throw the get into her home like he could do in the mission, according to the mission we just read when she is an adult? And he quotes our Mishnah, in discussing this problem, and if you look towards the end of his quote, um, it's in the Hebrew, it's the last word on the, 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 um, the third line from the bottom of the Hebrew, he quotes it, Hazore get li'ishto betoch beta. And he doesn't have the word vihi. He doesn't have the word vihi. And he found other commentators who quote that Mishnah with leaving out the word vi, and then Lo and Biel, as he was writing this volume of Mekorotu Misarot, he couldn't find, he would always look to the old manuscripts of the Mishnah, the old manuscripts of the Talmud to see if he could find one that would have this text. At first he didn't find it, but as he was publishing the book, his a friend of his professor Feldblum of Bar Ilan, who was putting out um, a volume on Gittin, on the different texts of Gittin, called up and said, hey, there is a, a, a Ktav Yad, a, a manuscript called the manuscript that's in Pharma, Parma, um, that does not have the word vihi in it. And so it turned out. So, so there actually were, was a tradition that this Mishnah did not have the word vihi in it, which would now explain why Reb Oshia said one could be in one city and the other, and the house could be in a different city. The last comment on this, um, 
on this is notice what it means. It means that if we go back, if we go back um, to the Gemara, if we scroll back to the passage in the Gemara, and we look there, what it means is the Gemara, which my, you know, what the Gemara is and who it is, the Stam is something he gave a great deal of thought to, clearly had the word Vihi in its text of the Mishnah. And that's why when Raboshia says they could be in different cities, the house in one city and she in a different city, the Gemara says, how could you say that? The Mishnah says, Vihi betoch beta. What's obvious is what the Gemara didn't know is that Rabbi Oshia had a different text of the Mishnah. And that Rabbi Oshia, when he said they could be in different cities, he had a text that didn't have the word vihi. Hence the strained answer. The Gemara is trying to figure out how Rabbi Oshia would explain this Mishnah. And in the Gemara's text, the Mishnah had the word vihi. And the, the Gemara came up the best it could. Well, it says if she is in the house, even when she's a thousand miles away. But if you know the sources and traditions, what you'll say is, how did Rabbi Oshia say it? Because his text of the Mishnah lacked the word vihi, unlike the text that the Gemara had. And that's, that's an example of where an awareness of the, the transmission and the fact that different Jews, different rabbis could transmit slightly different texts. And as a result of those differences come up with very different interpretations. Um, but the Gemara didn't always know that. And um, you therefore have the Gemara asking a question, thinking the text was one way, but they're asking a question on somebody who had a different text of the mission and interpreted it differently. Thank you very much. I know it's not easy to do. It's an example I also heard from your father uh, more, on more than one occasion. Um, I see the time is moving really quickly. So um, I'm going to ask you to address very briefly a little bit, going back to the to the other works that your father did theologically besides the Talmudic commentary, a word or two about his biblical theology, his idea, what he called Hatu Yisrael, the Am Yisrael sin. And if there's time at the end, also a word or two about his, uh, his Holocaust theology. Right. Well, very, uh, very hard to do al regal achat, but I will try. Um, and in his, he, as a, as a critical scholar, as an academic scholar of the Talmud, um, at some point, he began to see the look at the Torah with the same critical eye. And the same eye that would tell him in the Talmud, well, this seems to be comprised of different sources, different strains, um, uh, that people um, does not, um, uh, it does not, uh, it doesn't reconcile. He began, but it was he was okay with that in the Talmud. He began to look at the Torah the same way. And studying the 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 documentary hypothesis and the fact that, the, that those scholars say that the Torah is comprised of multiple sources, he had the same sense of text that they had, and he felt that they were right. And so his book on biblical theology was a way of reconciling his deep belief that the Torah came from God and there was a revelation, and at the same time explain why the Torah appears to be comprised of multiple sources um, that is suggested by the documentary hypothesis. And ultimately, his thesis on that is that the Torah was given by God without the strains, without the seams that you see in the documentary hypothesis. The Jews who were idolaters for most of their early history, we see that from the Tanakh, um, the, the, the prophets railing against the Jews, most of whom were idolaters, and um, were not very good at preserving the text. Um, so the text was no longer an immaculate text over time. The few Jews who tried to retain it were often persecuted. Um, and it was only in the time of Ezra that Ezra tried to recreate the original text. There were some maculations, some issues there. Um, and we have Ezra's best effort to reconstruct the Torah as it was received by Revelation of Har Sinai. But then there are sources that say that Ezra's efforts were essentially blessed by God. So we have actually a Torah given by God, but the Torah that we have is really the one God gave through Ezra. Um, um, and it, it's no longer exactly the same as given Har Sinai. Very tough for him to do that. He recognizes that that disagrees with one of the Rambam's critical principles um, of faith. And um, so that was a very difficult one. But that is Al Regal Achat, his, bibli his biblical theology. Do you want to say something about his Holocaust? Uh... Holocaust theology, that's, of course, even tougher. Um, and 
I think the, the, the way he put it was um, on Mount Sinai, we had a revelation of what life would be with, with God. And in Auschwitz, we had a revelation of what life would be without God. And um, rather than explaining that the Holocaust and all that happened fits within the framework that God gave us when he gave the Torah, he said, essentially, God stepped back, um, what some would call tzimtzum. Um, God stepped back and he gave free choice, complete free choice to um, mankind to choose whatever they want. And the Nazis chose to be completely and utterly evil. And that's why we pray um, to God. Uh, it's, we said in the high holidays that he should reign over us. He should rule over us because we no longer want to be in a world where there's no restraint by God and that man's free choice is utterly, utterly, utterly free to do anything, no matter how evil. Okay. Thank you. And needless to say, that was a very uh, intensely personal, uh, yes. personal topic for him as well. Um, I'm also, uh, part of what attracted me to your father when I first met him at the seminary in 1975 was also that uh, my father was from not so far away in the Carpathian Mountains, and I think I right, right away mm -hmm. heard it was the same accent, and then I uh, made the connection, and both Holocaust mm -hmm. survivors, and uh, also very, and, and until he wrote his autobiography, I think we didn't speak very much about, about the Shoah. Once he did that, and it sort of came out in the open, uh, became a, one of our big topics. Yes. And we, as, and a child, as a child, it was funny, my mom would speak about ho the Holocaust all the time. Um, she almost couldn't not speak about it. And Abba could never speak about it. It wasn't until many years later that he got to the point where he could think about it and speak about it and um, and write about it. That was not easy for him. Um, okay. Uh, we're nearing the end of the this part of the program before the questions. Um, I'll just ask you if you want to share any one or two particular personal mem memories that are special for you that you'd like to share with us? I'm sure there are endless numbers. There are many, there are many but I've, I've, you know, in preparing for this, I, I, I thought of two because I, I wanted to give an impression of him, not only as a scholar, but as a person. And I think, so you can, you can attest that, that so many people um, were intimidated by his knowledge, were almost afraid to talk to him. And then when they talked to him, they found out that he was gentle and, and caring and, and and inquisitive and and um, wanted to know about the person and and um, and people were very surprised that they could come with with very simple questions and find somebody who was happy to discuss it with them. So he was a very people person. He really really was a people person. In contrast to kind of the the stereotype of a of a scholar. Um, um, and um, two two examples from childhood um, which I want I wanted to share, um, which were just almost random examples. One is um, he was very sensitive to his students and the feelings of his students, almost to a fault, I thought. I remember one day coming home um, with him. We were walking, we were walking home. It was a Shabbat, and we were walking home from shul. And all of us, it was a winter day, and I see all of a sudden he's he starts turning up his collar and pulling down his hat. And it was a winter day, it wasn't that cold. Um, and I said, Abba, what are you doing? And he said, we just passed by a Treif restaurant and I saw one of my students eating Treif on Shabbat in the Treif restaurant. And I was afraid that if she would see me, she would be embarrassed. So I didn't want her to see that I was passing by. And I said, really? How about you? <laughs> I was kind of surprised. Like, you are the one who doesn't want to be seen? Um, so that was, I, I remember as a child, going, wow, that, 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 that impressed me. And in another childhood story that I'll share, a second one um, was... Uh, also on Shabbat, this time it was going to shul, um, and um, we lived at the bottom of a steep hill on 116th Street and Riverside Drive, and it was a very steep hill, and, and um, it was ve often very windy. Usually the wind would, was, was going um, from the bottom of the hill up with the direction, but this particular day, it was a very, very strong wind going down the hill in the opposite direction. And because it was Shabbat, um, we didn't carry anything. Uh, my father was of the view that there was no Eruv for the island of Manhattan, that you were not allowed to carry on Shabbat. And carry, of course, would include pushing a stroller or pushing a wheelchair, was also not permitted as part of the prohibition on carrying. And as we were walking up the hill on Shabbat, um, he looked up and there ahead of us was a man in a wheelchair, um, not an electric wheelchair, but a manual wheelchair, trying to push himself up the hill. But because the hill was so steep, 
and the wind coming down the hill was so strong, um, he couldn't he could make it. He would push up a, a foot and then roll back a foot and push up a foot and roll back a foot. And he was having an enormous amount of difficulty making it up this hill from Riverside Drive to 116th Street. And even though you're, my father was firmly of the view that you could not carry on Shabbat, I was astonished when he just let go of my hand, the frying was on the other side, let go of frying, and he ran up to the wheelchair and he pushed it up the block. And the man said, thank you. And my father said, of course. And then we're walking the rest of the way to Shul and I go, ah, oh, it's Shabbat, how did you do it? And he said to me, when a man in a wheelchair needs to get up a hill, we'll always find a way to help. And he never explained to me how he did it. He never explained to me what. And it was just instinct. You know, he saw that this, this man needed help and he went and he pushed him up the hill in a way that contradicted the very clear position he had taken pretty publicly that this was not something to be done. He did it. Well, thank you. That's a beautiful story. And I think it does capture a lot about uh, his personality and his warmth and uh, his menschlichkeit, which anyone who knew him uh, felt very, very, very strongly and clearly at all times. Thank you. Adina? I should, I should one thing, one thing I should add here, because today is the last day of the year, when a child repeats Torah from his father, you know, who's passed away or parent, Usually you expect to say Zecher Livracha, Zikron Livracha, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, may his memory be a blessing. But the Gemara says for the first year, you say, instead of saying Zikron Livracha, you're supposed to say Hareni Kaparat Nishmato. I am the atonement for his soul. I don't quite know the Arab, it's a Gemara in Kedushin, which I learned recently. So let me add it now that what I said today in his name, Hareni Kaparat Nishmato, today's really the last day for me to say that. Amen. Great. I, I don't know if you can hear me now. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great, great. So thank you so much for giving us just a tiny taste of uh, the mind and the life of um, your mentor, Tzvi, and your father, Baruch. It's really, really, truly a privilege. We have a couple questions. I'll start with um, one of the more broad questions, and that is trying to get at whether your father Baruch um, considered his his study um, of the Gemara to fall within sort of the traditional understanding of the mitzvah of Talmud, or whether there was something um, he was doing something different with all of his probing and testing. Ab absolutely understood it to be the learning of Torah. There's no question. I think the best way to illustrate it is for those of you who know, um, every morning is part of the davening or tefillah in the morning. There's a, a bracha that you make that you're supposed to make before you learn Torah. We say bracha on everything. Before you do any mitzvah, you're supposed to make a bracha. As part of our davening, we make a bracha. Um, and there are other brachot that go along with it. Um, and he would make that bracha and then dive into his studies because what he did was no more, no less Torah than anything else. The fact that he could understand why Raboshia did what he did, how could you not consider that Torah? That's amazing. Um, I'll, getting just into that, I'll just add to that, that he would often say, uh, even if you only study all day, the words of Beit Shammai were not accepted for halacha, but we don't paskin like Beit Shammai, that you still make the bracha of learning Torah. And what he was hinting at is that even if your learning is completely theoretical, like his was, not for halacha purposes, it's 100% Talmud Torah in the traditional sense. When you were um, giving your discussion of the methodology um, around the get, of giving a get, um, and you're talking about the various areas um, where a get would be considered legitimate or received, um, there was a question about the reference to that area and if that was connected in some way to, I guess, another reference of, of an area that, where, that where, where one could operate on Shabbat. I don't fully understand the question, um, so forgive me, but do you, does this, it, is this making sense it, to you? It, yes, yes, because on Shabbat, for example, you can, um, uh, as I said before, you can't carry publicly in public right. areas on Shabbat, but in your home, you can carry Shabbat. You can you could walk around with a key in your pocket when you're in your home, but if there isn't an area, you can't walk around publicly with a key in your pocket. But what can, is considered public or private for Shabbat purposes is not necessarily um, the same as what is considered your home for purposes of getting the get. At least according to the way the Gemara explained it, the get is, is the 
part with which is secure ledata, and it's it's not an it's not a dissimilar idea by any means. They are similar, but they're not exactly the same. Great. Um, and then getting back to, I guess, understanding the man a little bit more, there was a question about um, when he moved to Israel, when he made Aliyah, what was that about? Um, what community did he, he become a part of? When did that happen? Oh, that's, so he moved, when he moved to Israel, um, he moved to Jerusalem. And um, uh, he was looking for an apartment. My mother at the time was still alive, although she had declined considerably. She had Alzheimer's or something akin to Alzheimer's, and she was in her last stages. So when he came here, he brought her to a, a, a care, care facility. So he was looking um, for really an apartment for himself. And he wanted to live in what's called the Diskin, uh, the Wolfson Towers on Diskin Street. And... Um, um, he, this is a place which has a lot of retired rabbis from the States, some retired rabbis from Israel, a lot of retired academics, um, and so on. And the, 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 um, the real estate broker had no idea who he was, other than he was somebody from the States. So she would speak to him in English, and he would speak to her in English. And as they would go through Diskin, she would look at the apartments, the elevated door would open, and somebody would walk in, and somebody would say, David, I haven't seen you in years. Come for Shabbat dinner. He'd say, okay. And then the elevator would open it again. Some would say, Dovid, shanim lo ra'iti otcha. Years I haven't seen you. I wanted to ask you something about Makarot and Misarot. He said, okay, let's schedule some. Then it would open again. And somebody in Yiddish would, would, would come in and would start arguing with him. And there was some passionate argument that this poor woman didn't understand. Um, and they're standing in the elevator and he's gotten to some long discussion about the Gemara in Yiddish with somebody who walked in. And finally she turns to him and she goes, I think you've been here before at some point to have you. So he kind of laughed and he said, yes. He goes, I don't think you're going to have much trouble adjusting to your aliyah. So that was the community he looked for. He looked for a community of intellectuals, but ranging from professors to conservative rabbis to ultra-Orthodox rabbis and so on. And at the same time, the shul that he went to was interesting. He went to a shul called Kahal Hasidim. It was a shtibel. It was full of Hasidim. Of, of different stripes, but Hasid was very ultra orthodox. And he went there. I said, Abba, why are you going there? This isn't your world anymore. This is your world as a child. And he goes, That's why I'm going there. It reminds me of the Shulai Davin as a child. And there are even some people from my hometown of Sigit who are there, who knew people that I knew. And I would say to him, I go, But Abba, nobody here has ever heard of you. Like they don't even know who you are. You walk into other shuls and everybody stands up. You walk into this shul and you just go sit down. And people even, he goes, it's okay. He had he had a long-standing saying where he'd say, the people that I daven with aren't the same people that I talk to. The people that I talk to aren't the same people that I daven with because he talks academic and he davens from religious. He says, it's okay. These are the people I daven with. These aren't the people that I talk to. It's really beautiful. Um, I guess I, I, I want to ask you something to continue on the personal front. Um, one of the first questions um, was about what uh, lesson or value that your father stood for are you making sure that you um, are conveying to your children, that your father conveyed mm -hmm. to you? And knowing your family and your wonderful children, um, I, I, th I think it's, uh, it, it will be very, uh, well, very revealing and beautiful to hear. I think, I think what what he tried to convey, and I hope I can convey to, to, to our, our three kids, is that um, no matter, you can pursue and you must be honest in, in your pursuit of knowledge. You cannot bend the inquiry one way or another to try to fit any preconceived result. You just follow it. But no matter how much you do that and you publish whatever you find, and it could alienate the people that you grew up with, that, that could well happen but you can be intensely religious and devoted at the same time. There's no, there, there is no contradiction between full academic freedom and intense religious devotion. Well, that gives us a lot to think about. Um, and hopefully this is the beginning of um, unfolding more of the teachings of, of your father. Um, and Svi, I know you have a lot to share and you have nuggets for, of your learning and um, experience being mentored um, by Harav. 
Professor David Weisselivny, um, and we hope to explore more with both of you in the future. Um, and thank you for um, being a part of the National Library of Israel and our mission to um, have these opportunities and share these opportunities of unusual thinking and probing and questioning uh, and bringing that to the community at large. So with that, I thank you all for joining us um, and um, you can stay in touch with us uh, via NLI USA's website and NLI's website. And, um, and we hope to see you again in the future. Be well, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.